And Jesus stands at the center of the story like, like a great mirror or a bright light. And as the events unfold, people make their choices and the motives of the characters around Jesus are exposed. And we can see them clearly for who they really are and who they really are serving. And sometimes we Christians avoid seeing ourselves in the bright light of Jesus. We assume that this is a story about Romans and Jews. And as long as they remain the villains, whoever they are, then we're kind of off the hook, or so we think. Unfortunately, this is not a story that happened long, long ago in a land far, far away. Because the truth is, sons and daughters of God are killed in every generation. They've been killed in holy wars and inquisitions, in concentration camps and prison cells. They've been killed in Syria, Abu Ghraib, Russia, the Mexican border. And the charges against them have run the gamut, but national security and blasphemy are often at the top of the list, just as they were for Jesus. Jesus dared to anger the powers that be at the courthouse and at the temple. He suggested that they were not doing right by the people they were called to serve. And in the light of his presence, they were exposed, shamed by what everyone could see. And rather than change what they were doing, they destroyed him any way that they could. And for me, one, well, there are many ironies in the story, but for me, the biggest irony in this story is that Jesus was not brought down by the powers of atheism or anarchy. He was brought down by law and order, allied with religion, which is always a deadly mix, isn't it? Beware of those who claim to know the mind of God. Beware of those who are prepared to use force, if necessary, to make others conform. If you have to have temple police, that's always a bad sign. <laughs> and when chaplains start wearing guns and hanging out at the sheriff's office, watch out. Someone is about to have no king but Caesar. This is a story that can happen anywhere, at any time. And we are as likely to be the perpetrators as the victims. And I doubt that many of us will end up playing Caiaphas the high priest or, or Pontius Pilate. They may have been the ones that gave Jesus the death sentence, but a large part of him had already been killed before they ever got to him. The part that his good friends Judas killed off. And then Peter. And then all those people who fled. Those, maybe, are the roles with our names on them, not as enemies, but as friends. Have you ever noticed how when someone gets in trouble, um, the TV cameras always seem to focus on his friends and neighbors to kind of gain some insight into what, whatever motivated this person? What do his friends say? Do they support him? Or do they tell the reporters that they'd seen this trouble brewing all along? One of the worst things a friend can say is what Peter said. Well, we weren't friends exactly. Acquaintances might be a better word. Actually, actually we just worked together, for the same company I mean. Not together, just near each other. My desk was near his. I don't really know him at all. Nobody knows what Judas, what Judas said. In John's Gospel, he doesn't say a word. But where he stands says it all. After he has led some 200 <clears throat> Roman soldiers and temple police to the garden where Jesus is praying, Judas stands with the militia, not with his friends. And even when Jesus comes forward to identify himself, Judas doesn't budge. He's on the side with the weapons and the handcuffs and the 30 pieces of silver 
and he intends to stay there. <clears throat> or maybe it wasn't his own safety that motivated him, motivated him. Maybe he just fell out of love with Jesus. That happens sometimes. One day you think someone is wonderful, and the next day he says or does something that makes you think twice. He reminds you of the difference between the two of you, and you start hating him for that, for the difference. Hating him enough to begin thinking of some way to hurt him back. One preacher told the story of, of being at a retreat once where the leader asked them to think of someone who represented Christ in their lives. And when it came time to share their answers, one woman stood up and said, I had to think hard about that one. I kept thinking, who is it who told me the truth about myself so clearly that I wanted to kill him for it? According to John, Jesus was executed because he told the truth to everyone he met. He was the truth, a perfect mirror in which people saw themselves in God's own light. And what happened then continues going, happening now. In the presence of his integrity, our pretense is exposed. In the presence of his constancy, our cowardice is brought to light. In the presence of his fierce love for God and for people, our own hardness of heart is revealed. If you take Jesus out of the room, all those things come, become kind of relative. I'm not much worse than you are, and you're not much worse than I am. But leave him in the room, and there's no place to hide. He really is the light of the world. And in his presence, people either fall down to worship him or do everything they can to put out his light. A cross and nails, they're not always necessary. There are a thousand ways to kill him. Some, of the, some as obvious as choosing where you will stand when the showdown between the weak and the strong comes. Others are as subtle as keeping your mouth shut when someone asks if you know him. Today, while he dies, don't turn away. Make yourself look in the mirror. Today, none of us get away without being shamed by his beauty. Today, no one flees without being laid bare by his light. <clears throat>